everybody. We are ready for our next panel. Um, the, to give you an introduction, the Belong Literature Festival, or BOLF, is an initiative of Belong, a social venture that seeks to bring discrimination-free services and experiences to people who face identity-based discrimination. We run programs for inclusive housing, mental health, research, as well as a book club and library for inclusive literature. You can learn more about these on www.belong.net. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge the tireless efforts of our festival partners, our media partner, The Wire, our cultural partner, the British Council, and our accessibility partner, Access for All, without whom this event would not be possible. So for today's, uh, for this session, it is Sexuality Under the Scanner, Narratives from South Asia with Nimad Sadat, Shaikat Majumdar, and Sharif Rangnekar. The session will be moderated by Manjari Sahai, who is the book club and library associate at Belong. That's all from me, over to you, Manjari. Thanks, Surbhi. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this panel discussion on sexuality under the scanner, narratives from South Asia. So it's a little past 11 a.m., and I'm quite impressed <laughs> by this turnout on a Saturday morning, um, but also not totally surprised because I myself am very excited for today's conversation. I really enjoyed getting to know the works of these panelists who I'm near certain will make today's conversation critical, engaging, as well as intimate, given that you're all sort of familiar with each other's life and art worlds to some extent. And uh, I hope that'll make for an interesting conversation. So I'm just going to begin by introducing uh, the panelists for today first. Um, our first panelist for today is Neemat Sadat. Uh, Neemat, did I say your name right? Yes, you did. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, Neemat is the author of the debut novel, uh, The Carpet Weaver, which was published by Penguin Random House India in June 2019. Um, the debut opened to wide critical acclaim in the Indian national press and was India's most written about debut fiction last year. Uh, Neemat is the first native from Afghanistan to publicly come out as gay and campaign for LGBTQI rights in Muslim communities worldwide. Currently, he is working on a second novel, Keeping Up with the Hepburns, while pursuing a master's degree in writing at Johns Hopkins University. Our second panelist is Shoykat Majumdar. Uh, I think I got your name right, given that I was your student. It, there's very little room for me to, you know, screw that up. Yeah. <laughs> um, Shoykat is a novelist, scholar, and uh, a commentator on arts, literature, and higher education. He is the author of three novels, The Scent of God, uh, one of Times of India's 20 most talked about Indian books of 2019, The Firebird, and Silverfish. He has also published a book of literary criticism, Prose of the World, uh, a general non-fiction book on higher education, College Pathways of Possibility, and a co-edited collection of essays, The Critic as Amateur. He is taught at Stanford University, was named a fellow at the Humanities Center at Wellesley College, and is currently professor of English and Creative Writing at Ashoka University. And our third and final panelist for today is Sharif Rangnekar. Sh Sharif Rangnekar. It's hilarious that I stumbled upon that one, given that that was the name I was convinced was the easiest. Um, but I hope I said that right. I may as well check in. I, I prefer to pronounce it as Sharif. Sharif, okay. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. But people call me all kinds of things. Okay, great. Sharif <laughs> Rangnekar. Uh, the author of Straight to Normal, uh, My Life as a Gay Man. Sharif is a communications consultant and former journalist with over 25 years of experience. He uses various platforms, talks, writing, and music to advocate change and garner support for the LGBTQ plus community. He curates the platform Embrace Music Justice Arts, which blends art with social justice. He is also the festival director of the Rainbow Lit Fest Queer and Inclusive, which started out in 2019. In addition to all of this, Sharif provides counsel in the area of diversity and inclusion in the workplace specific to the LGBTQ community. So this is a little bit about our panelists for today. And uh, I just want to sort of launch into the discussion uh, without wasting any time. Um, and, you know, over the course of this conversation, we're going to pick out some of the similarities and differences between all of your works. So my first question is, um, 
you know, obviously related to the title of the panel, Sexuality Under the Scanner. And uh, I was hoping we could begin by talking about the relationship between sexuality and coming of age, which is a period that all of you write about uh, in your works differently. Um, it's a period of heightened sexual scrutiny. Um, and, you know, I was wondering why is the sexuality of young adults in particular subject to so much scanning, so to speak, if we are to go with the language of the of the prompt, uh, and what made you want to write about it? So I, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, delineate sort of an order, and it'll vary with each question to make sure everybody um, gets a chance to go first or last or whatever might be the case. Uh, so Shoika, could we begin with you? Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Manjuri. And, and thank you for having me in this festival. I think in a climate where people are beginning to get jaded with literary festivals, I love the idea of a festival of inclusion, which I think was also the theme of uh, the Rainbow Festival, which I participated last year. Uh, and I also, I should also say that I love the expression sexuality under the scanner. There's something machine-like. I mean, the scanner is a machine. It's a medical machine. Uh, it's a machine we go through, airport security, you know, and I love um, how that image actually contains the image of vigilance. You know, that, that, and, and, that, and there's something um, slightly dangerous about it, which I think is really appropriate given the current world we are living in. So I, I really like the title. Um, as far as um, coming of age is concerned, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, coming of age or the Bildungsroman is that two of my novels are actually very much Bildungsromans. The Firebird, my second novel, and uh, The Scent of God, the, the third one. And um, the, I, I think I have a peculiar interest in this genre because um, the, the, the coming of age novel, as you know, is also called the novel of education. And as you can imagine, I have a complex relationship with the theme of education. Um, and I think the coming of age novel in its classic variety shows how an individual from childhood to adulthood is kind of integrated into normative society, how they become like what society and state wants them to be, become. And in its classical European variation, it was a white male, you know, how, they, how it ends with becoming a father and a proper citizen and getting a job and end of education and all those things, which sort of in many ways a vision of a certain capitalist society sees itself that we are, you become a productive member. And when you become a productive member, sort of the build up ends. I guess in my novels, I've been very interested in how this education fails. So somehow my novels have been described as anti Bildungsromans. They are really look like Bildungsromans, but they're actually anti because in some ways they sort of fail. And obviously in, in the case of Scent of God, um, the idea of a young child growing into a life of a normative sexuality, taking up certain civil responsibilities. And you know, those of you who've read the novel know that the novel doesn't go that way at all. It is kind of in a way, um, they fail. And um, a friend of mine um, on a panel, um, Anjum Hassan, once pointed out um, on discussing this novel was that how both my protagonists in both my novels, because they have very troubled family lives, they are probably liberated from the middle class aspiration of, oh, you must grow up, clear IIT, join, whatever, and uh, become a certain kind of individual. And that freedom makes their life chaotic. So I'm really interested in that, uh, the failure of that. And as on top of that, I've always been interested in the subject of childhood and early youth, because I think this is a fascinating time when, um, when you are terribly moved by things, but you don't really understand why they are moving you or troubling you. There's a strange gulf between experience and understanding. And I think great art lies in this gap between experience and understanding, a time of kind of primitive pleasures, joys, fears, but you don't quite understand. And with the particular instance of this novel, it was my question was, how does sexual awakening comes with puberty? How does one come, how does come realize? And I realized that in many ways, when the sexual um, urges come in the growing body, uh, it comes, it, it precedes an awareness of gender. In a simple way, it's like, um, you know, you crave a touch. You don't really care whether the touch belongs to a boy or a girl or a man. You crave a certain human connection. And I'm obviously very interested in the persistent of the connection that at what level we don't really care 
what the sex of the person who's touching us what is the meaning of the connection but i think this connection is particularly potent at that age when people are figuring out and obviously you know a big part of the realization of who you are which is what the coming of age is about the becoming is who you are sexually and this i think is an incredibly fluid moment of course it so happens in my novel the protagonist do take a certain direction they take certain decisions about their sex sexuality but of course the novel ends when they are 18 so in a way it does it is exactly a bildungs roman but i'm fascinated by that and on top of that obviously as you if, if you read the novel you know that it is happens in an atmosphere of great austerity and vigilance where sexuality is strongly policed it's very very much a scanner very much a saffron scanner in this case that why you're supposed to be celibate why the idea of brahmacharya is essential to a certain kind of growth and it is all happening in the shadow of this vigilance so i'm fascinated by um coming of it generally because of its fluidity its darkness but in this particular case the sexual coming of age was actually very rich and lurid for me Hmm. Wow, that's really opened up a lot of themes uh, for both Sharif and Neema to go over. But Sharif, if we can come to you next. Yeah, so uh, so I think when we're we're talking about the issue of sex, you know, uh, the scanner, and uh, as far as my book goes, uh, the two are not connected. I think uh, you know we're coming over a long period of time. i think if you if you go back to the 90s the consumerism the i started creeping in into the world you know the choices that a first person can make through a credit card you know financial independence then it came to rooms uh and the paint in in, in the room of a child on the walls uh you know all these various forms of i started creeping in a tv that used to be shared with the family now the tvs you know came into separate rooms people started choosing what they wanted to watch uh you know all of those things have started to happen over a long period of time but i think what we also seen is with the with the kind of content and information flowing across the world where a large young population also asserts their own identity and their idea of love itself and they've been through a long period of of love being defined in a certain manner being put in a specific box i think a lot of them are challenging also consumerism and economic independence that has also come in over the period of reforms etc from the 90s has also given them a sense of wanting to enjoy life as such on their own and not necessarily go down the same route so i'm generalizing a lot of this as well uh and when you go into colleges universities etc uh, things like that i think what chaitra was talking about is if you don't question at that point in time your sense of intimacy or sense of touch over certain things and how you respond to all of those so while that all all of that is kind of happening i think people are starting to realize that they need also something in a, at a certain level to identify with so they are getting more aware of also identifying the touch as such which they then start talking about you know and you also have icons and you still have people in the popular culture for example a madonna on stage kissing another woman and not saying she's bisexual not saying anything but perhaps trying to appeal to a certain audience also so there are a lot of these things happening simultaneously around i think a large section of uh, the young which is starting to to kind of get them to to state who they are find a certain identity and i'm hearing stories a lot of you know uh, whether they gay or lesbian some of them suddenly telling me that you know i think i'm non binary and i i don't belong uh, you know it's a fluid situation i've had people when we opened up our workplace years ago i've had married women with a child coming and suddenly saying that you know i want to try uh, a girl and i want to uh, and, and what do i do so you know i think the i think there is this information flow there is consumerism there's marketing there's identity all playing at around the same time but coming to my book actually it's something i wanted to do years ago and and 
I was somewhat scared to write it, write it under my name, but I couldn't write fiction. And uh, so I, I, I just didn't go with it. And then the third, 2013 order came. And really, one of the driving forces behind the book is, I mean, while I wanted to tell the story, is when my mom came to me and said, that if you share the story, it might help others. So don't do it for publicity, but do it with a purpose, and which is what I wanted to do. It was really about a purpose. I, I in fact, run away from publicity as far as possible. I was frightened. And uh, so uh, so that's how the book came out, you know, came into being. And, and, uh, and it was to share a journey, which is why I think I start from zero to age 50, you know. And uh, so, yeah, but the two aren't really doing um, Neema, I know some of your motivations for writing your book were similar to Sharif, uh, Sharif's in that um, you also wanted to perhaps help other people. Uh, but again, coming back to the question of that particular age that you explore in your uh, novel, could you tell us a little bit about that and sexuality? Absolutely. Well, you know, sexuality is a big component of my debut novel, The Carpet Weaver, but it's not the defining thing. And it's also not the defining thing of anyone. But uh, I, would say, I would say the sexual awakening that Kanishka experiences uh, is kind of in, like kind of sets the stage for the story. Right. And uh, obviously he also experiences an intellectual awakening. Uh, you know, an artistic awakening, a political awakening, but really sexuality is so intrinsic to not just LGBTQIA people, but all human beings. And I think let's just be real, you know, self-repression is a real thing. And not just in Afghanistan, where uh, obviously homosexual and transgender people have to hide it because they'll be criminalized to death. I mean, I just heard today about this one transgender person who's escaped and the kind of persecution and torture they suffered uh, for just being sexually active and being, you know, for just because of their gender identity, having their, all of their nails plucked out, beaten and tortured and killed and the way that they had to escape just from doing something. And, you know, throughout, it's not just now, this is something that's been going on throughout the centuries where people have been trying to control people's bodies. You control LGBTQIA bodies and women's bodies, you can control the whole nation. But it's also heterosexual people, you know, even heterosexual people are repressed. Um, many people do not get proper sex education. I think that there's a fascination with books about young adult sex is the fact that everybody's trying to relive their own experiences vicariously through somebody else. You know, I, I know that's the case for me. Um, and, and I got triggered when I read Call Me By Your Name. And I was like, wait a minute, how come Elio's had it so good? I had to like pretend, you know, to, to pursue women in the opposite sex and fight my family, my whole nation and death threats and fought what? How come this guy has a romantic affair in the Italian countries that nobody finds out about it, even when their parents find out everything's fine? So it's all this angst and I was like, but still, we know that, uh, you know, in India and in Afghanistan, in the United States, you don't get proper sex education. Let's just be real. I think Netherlands and maybe a few Scandinavian countries, they start at a very young age and, and all that things. And, and so people are control or experimenting with their bodies. And my bo I think what separates erotica from literary fiction and Bildung's Roman particularly is this concept of, you know, bottle, focus on bodily pressure versus the sexual experience that happens within the mind. And so for Kanishka, he's communicating, and my fictional hero, the sexual experience that he has that through his journey of how that's impacting him and in his own place in the world. So I think that's very fascinating. I think, to, to be honest with you, I mean, of course, I'm a very sex positive person, but when it comes to literature, I find it more interesting of what the mind experiences through the process of sex acts, negotiating sex with people, the maturation of sex. It's a fascinating topic. And it's one that, um, that, that you know, we're, we're trying to still figure out. So I think there's a lot of curiosity comes in uh, from that. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the things I will have to say that, you know, one of the people who are disappointed uh, with the carpet weaver, and I read the reviews, and said, you know, I would have given this book five stars when it first came out, but they said they just couldn't because they're like, I was expecting an LGBT novel and, and this is not LGBT. And I, and I was curious, I read the full review 
And they basically wanted sex and sexuality in the forefront. They're like, this book talked about war and politics and these types of other things. And that really offended me. It's like, wait a minute. So LGBTQI people can only be experts on matters of sex and sexuality that everything else in the world, the economy, politics, war, everything else, we, everything else in this planet we give to heterosexual people because they can do this better. And I think that's very offensive. Of course, like I said, and sexuality, we shouldn't negate it. Uh, like we should, you know, it should be under the scanner. It should be a first scrutiny, but we should also not just pigeonhole entire community that, you know, define people, LGBTQI people, just based on sexual acts, because we're more than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. So moving on to uh, my next question. Um, you've all in previous interviews, and I've read a bunch of them, um, spoken about the relationship between your life and your writing. And Sharif obviously flagged that a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, but certainly you all borrow very different elements from life. Uh, and I was hoping we could talk a little bit about what those elements are, but also what you perceive as the relationship between writing and life. So maybe we can begin with you, uh, Sharif, this time. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, see, I've been a journalist, I've been a reporter. So I've, whatever I've reported uh, has always been about life you know, and what's happening. And, uh, you know, whether it was business journalism or whether I was reviewing music, or uh, it was, you know, various things that uh, one wrote about and uh, reported about. Uh, that was always it. There was a constant. I am, and I think Shaikat knows that because once we had a conversation, and I said I've never been a person uh, in the literary sense uh, of someone who follows literature that closely. Uh, I think uh, till I was in college, I did. Uh, but I think we didn't have the best teachers. And my best teachers were in class 11 and 12, who made Shakespeare very, very interesting. Uh, and I think later on, my first job was at the publishing house of Nimat, and that was, for me, the end of reading books, Penguin books. And it had nothing to do with Penguin. It, it just had the fact that I wanted to deal with life as things. And perhaps I had a lot to do with my own search of the self and to, to find it in real life because there was an absence of anything that seemed to be like me and I still didn't know what I am. So, uh, so my search, I think, started happening with reporting. Not that I was reporting on gender and sexuality. And if you know the press, by and large, is homophobic. They don't still want to write also about gender. They still don't want to write about sexuality the way they should. Uh, they don't want to deal with sexual, you know, sex education. They have columns, they have supplements on education, but none of them actually get into the space. So they are as futile as most of society seems to be. Uh, so, but, 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 but I think for me, writing somewhere deep down and being a reporter was also about affirming a space in society or getting a space in society. And you know, I worked my butt off, uh, and 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 uh, also was rewarded for it. But that wasn't the objective. Uh, but it was also a, a sense of power, I think, in a certain way, to to you know, to the way one reported on various subjects. And it was a lot of my reporting was challenging power. And even when I got into the communication and public relations space, I, I. Uh, the initial period was enjoyable just to learn something new, but you also realized you're getting stuck in a power structure. And I started challenging uh, a lot of a lot of that. And but what I learned during those eight ten years in that field was simplicity in communication, in writing, is one way to get greater access. You know, or to provide greater access to a larger number of people. And so in a way, you could see that uh, in, uh, you know, in journalism, you could see that in certain forms of storytelling that were there, uh, you know, whether it was music, whether it was street plays, 
etc. Uh, there was just so many firms. I think so to me, all of these factors kind of helped me connect with the self as well, you know, and uh, and to to connect with uh, the world outside. So a lot of responses even to the book is like uh, uh, when I was in a it was Bangalore, someone said they felt like they were sitting in a cafe and I was talking and, and telling them a story. Uh, there have been a lot of people who've been somewhat scared of, of reading books and books that they perhaps should read, uh, felt that this was easy to go through. And I think so it's a combination of the fact that I wanted to get closer and closer and closer with you and remove as many filters as possible and and come up close uh, with people. That has always been part of the way I've been writing, at least in the last, I would say, eight, ten years. Uh, uh, more than in my reporting days. In my reporting days, I would use jargon. I would use, uh, you know, what they would call bombastic language or things like that. So I think that was always my, uh, you know, way and mean. And which is why even at the Lit Fest, we use different means of, you know, forms of expression. So it's it's that so that it becomes a little more relatable. So I think that's where I see the connections between uh, writing and uh, self as well. Yeah. Uh, Neema, would you like to go next on that relationship between life and writing? Absolutely, sure. So yeah, so my first book, uh, you know, it started out because um, the self self-repression I was experiencing and I it was a cathartic experience because I felt like the first words I was getting on my page was basically the inner turmoil you know fighting the demons in my head and this was back in 2008 when I, I hadn't even come out to out of the closet and I only had like one friend that I had literally come out to um, after he came out to me he was my first friend in the United States in kindergarten we were friends and you know he came out to me and and so for me, that was the starting point. And then also my own experience of unrequited love, which is also a theme and the, you know, I don't want to give away the ending, but it is something Kanishka experiences in The Carpet Weaver. Um, and so those definitely are from my own experience. Um, and I know we have, in terms of the identities, I would say this is an own voices book. It's, we share the same identities, Kanishka and I, were both, you know, gay, Afghan, refugees, uh, you know, lived, moved to the United States, you know, so these are definitely from Muslim background, but also an ex-Muslim, which we will talk about in the next, I, I will talk about later, but I just wanted to talk about how, you know, those identities helped, were like the building blocks of my own experience, but also um, just the kind of living this kind of like dichotomy, realizing that I'm a stranger in a strange land, realizing that I could never go back to Afghanistan and, you know, and when I did, you know, I was never fully accepted there, never fully accepted here, always being the stranger in a strange land. I think that, uh, and knowing that there's a part of me that, it's, that, you know, society will just never accept, I just, writing from the space of the other. I mean, right now it's like in literature, I think that, you know, most of the literature, unfortunately, that's coming out anywhere on the planet, in India, in the United States, in UK, is projecting the dominant narrative, right? And what I wanted to do in my own writing was like, no, I am going to challenge that dominant narrative. Just, show, just like Sharice saying, you know, in your small ways, you know, doing whatever we can to bring change. And just like, you know, Shaikot was saying that, you know, the aspirations of the middle class, which what we call here the American dream. And by the way, the, the conscious, this idea of the American dream is not just, it's something that America has perverted around the world into the minds of, Indian youth and everybody else, that there's a certain, only a certain one kind of way that people can live. And Sheriff mentioned the hyper-consumerism and, and the aspirations. I think that's very interesting because Shaika's own life is close to the American dream, but then he's writing to challenging it. But still, I think as an artist, we always are trying to do things. We all have, we're very complex creatures. We might have contradictions, but, or we might, you know, writing can be a fantasy mode. For me, it was a radical escapist fantasy because I was like, you know, I don't like the life I'm living at the moment. Of course, I love my life now. But at the moment when I was like, oh, my God, I had this huge weight on my back. How am I going to come out to my family and community? And then it's like 
it's I know that it's I knew at the time it's going to be a never ending battle. Keep coming out, keep coming out. How many times have to come out to the whole world? And it's just I felt like you know what? Let me just go to this alter ego of mine, Kanishka. What would like what would life have been? Romanticizing this idea that maybe if I would have lived in Afghanistan and had a lover at a young age and had this escapist moment and maybe life would have been different for me. So that's kind of where it all came from. Sometimes, you know, your imagination gets fueled by your real life. You know, sometimes, you know, people don't realize that, that having uh, these experiences like traumas and wounds is actually a good thing. You know, when I uh, write, even to this day, I'm taking creative writing workshops and I'm reading a lot of white heterosexual middle class writing who lived the American dream. And it's all about this teenage angst, about this feeling of emptiness and loneliness because they've had too much love and they don't know any hardship. And, and I haven't really faced any real obstacles, but it's just like, that's not a story, you know, in my mind. And I don't want to be mean and by dismissing that as pedestrian or something, but I'm trying to say is like, because they're fitting within the dominant narrative, but those are the things like my own work has not been published here at US and UK. You know, and I think that, I think what scares me about India is that like, not just the, the you know, like the ruling party in power, but just in literature, I'm scared that the future will come where people are gonna to try to create a dominant narrative. And that's not the case. Right now, the Indian literary community is very fluid. Everybody has a chance to get published in different kinds of voices, whether you're a dominant, uh, you're, you're parroting the dominant narrative, which I don't really think there is one, but you know, they're trying to establish one. And then there's also the other, like writing the other. And I think all of our writings, Sharif, Shakas, and myself are really the other because we are showing a different side, uh, you know, of the culture that has always been in the closet, in the shadows, um, and we're just emerging. So I think that, um, you know, I think that that makes for interesting things, you know, and we could talk about this later on and what that all means. But I think that writing is definitely fueled from our life. And I tell people, like when I was at Oxford University, my creative writing program, I mean, my classmates, I felt really intimidated because they had read all the great masterpieces of literature when they were like 12 and 13. And I didn't, I mean, I, I read in school, like all the Buildings Roman that was required reading, like Catcher in the Rye, Huckleberry Finn, you know, Moby Dick, which was like, we had to read in English things and all the Shakespeare stuff. But then I didn't really read. I didn't come after my own intellectual awakening, which was after the December 11th terrorist attacks. And I had graduated from an international business degree pursuing the American dream. And then I was like, no, this is not the life I want to live. I don't want to chase the American dream. I want to align with my soul, align with my spirit. And I want to, I went and did research about the ancient civilization of Afghanistan, the actual history of the United States, you know, not the ones that were spoon fed. And just appreciation, cultural appreciation for other cultures and other civilizations. And I think that somehow became part of my experience, you know, part of my daily experience, part of the conversations I was having. So I think that, you know, uh, definitely art fuels life and life fuels art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shoika, you're up. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Now, it's a very important question, life writing, because it's something we talk a lot about um, in creative writing classes too. And I'm just the way I'm, I'm, I'm very jealous of, uh, you know, people like Sharif and Nima, who have this great journalistic experience, they have this great, and we have a different space. I, I, and I often get asked, um, you know, what gets you started? What, 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 what is that you start with? Do you start with a plot, a character? Um, you know, and my answer is, um, well, I think character is obviously very important, probably more important than plot, I believe, along with Virginia Woolf. The first thing for me is always place. Uh, for me, I cannot imagine an experience, uh, a story without an atmosphere. I'm a very atmospheric writer and I've been called my reviews and criticism that my writing is sort of cinematic, you know, kind of, it's very, very, um, very visual. And uh, for me, I have to be really compelled by um, a kind of an atmosphere, a kind of almost it has to kind of hold me, almost drug me. And, um, you know, with the fireboard, it was about this culture of theater, you know, watching a play from a dark space, the green room, the wings. And in this case, it was, um, it was a real place I've known. And for me, the atmosphere has to be rooted in reality. 
I need a seed of reality. And as all writers, you know, Sharif and um, you know, um, uh, certainly Nimat as a fiction writer will know that we can turn the seed into a forest, you know, but at least for me, I need that seed. Some writers are very good at completely inventing everything. I mean, again, what invention is a diff different debate, uh, but I do need that seed of reality. And in this case, I, uh, and this is again where uh, my personal relationship comes in. I have known this atmosphere. I myself went to a school like this. This school is real. Um, it's there in Bengal. Uh, it's a school, uh, boarding school run by a saffron order. And I, um, and I, this atmosphere compelled me that this in amazing atmosphere of saffron brotherhood where religion is not an abstract thing, but a very sensual thing, you know, and, and in the middle of it, the kind of competitiveness, the, the boy's life, all of that. And um, I thought, why has this, this atmosphere not been depicted in fiction? And it took me to places, you know, obviously we've had stories about, you know, Catholic schools or nunneries, but somehow in, with Hinduism, which for me is in many ways a very sensory religion, like Catholicism, unlike Protestantism. And I think it'll be interesting to hear, um, you know, what Nimad feels about when the role of Islam is, because Islam in many ways is a, a more abstract religion, a more intellectual religion, as opposed to Hinduism, which is a more physical, a more sensory religion. And I thought I had to write about it. And once that got me going, um, the story is largely invented. Uh, the characters are a mix. You know, there is some real, some um, some invented, often multiple real life characters made up one character. You know how it goes. You just sort of get going. But for me, it's about getting the momentum. And the momentum for me is always a place. And I should be able to smell the place, touch the place. And sometimes I don't even realize it. I mean, I've recently finished um, an, a new novel where, you know, um, it's partly set in the US, partly in Delhi. And you don't even realize that a place touches you while you're in the experience, you feel okay. I'm leading this boring life. Five years later, you suddenly something strikes you. Oh my God! I didn't think that I was processing that at that time. So it's a it's it's a bit like what Wordsworth said. You know, emotions recollected. You know, it's always coming back to you in the past. Um, so again, I mean, the question of what one knows is, of course, a very vague one because you know when one does research. And that's also kind of a knowledge. And I have a lot of students who write about, you know, sort of sort of the life they see in digital media, you know, Netscape and Amazon Prime being and a certain kind of dystopian reality. And I think that's all very well. I think it's what's important is your relationship with that life, that setting must come across as authentic. There was a Bengali writer, Bhutabhushan Bandhubhadhyay, who wrote this sort of this um, teenage classic called, um, uh, called Chachadir Pahar, Moon Mountain. It was set in Africa and he had never left India. So he completely wrote out of this imagination of what Africa might be. And um, for me, I mean, when I say right, research, I mean, research is for me when you step out of your everyday life to gain information. So for instance, if a doctor or a lawyer writes a novel which is full of details about um, sort of the legal profession or the medical profession, for me, that's not research because you already inhabit that life. You know, when you step out, when a doctor writes about a novel full of details with legal life about which, so that for me is research. And for me, I have always been a writer who often found myself researching memory. You know, so these are roles I've known at different points of time, maybe 20 years back, maybe five years back, maybe it's usually from the past. And there's a way of jogging memory and there's a way of talking to people. Um, but that primary impulse, that push, you know, I, I must write a story where I'm sort of the story holds me by the scarf of my neck and says it demands to be written. And for me, that came from the smell and the smell of saffron, the smell of religion was absolutely seductive. And I won't deny that, you know, the world we live in today had something to do with it, though that part has remained very muted in the novel. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you've flagged my uh, next question, uh, which is uh, about the various intersections of identity or belonging that one finds in South Asia and all of your books uh, discuss it in different ways. So while Shoykat and Nima's books consider some of those intersections between sexuality, religion, nation. Uh, Sharif's book 
discusses, among other things, belonging at the workplace and by extension, uh, the relationship between class and sexuality. And I know you've been involved in uh, some advocacy around that. So uh, could we talk a little bit about what these intersections look like in your works and what about them strikes you, confuses you, fascinates you? Um, so I'd like to begin with uh, Nima this time around, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Well, Alea, I'd like to uh, first of all address um, Shai Kant's, uh, you know, comment about the Islam and, and, you know, I think the Sufi branch of Islam, uh, you know, is more esoteric and it has more sensuality, which is one of the reasons why I brought more of the Rumi poetry in my, in my work, you know, and, and other poems from that era. But, uh, you know, which, like, you know, so that just answer that. But I think that in my case, you know, you know, my character, fictional character is half Shia, half Sunni, Muslim, you know, obviously gay, obviously come his, his father is a Maoist and he joins the Maoist, you know, political party. And then he's bound by the traditions of Afghaniyat. So he definitely <laughs> receives a sexual, religious, political persecution, you know, and uh, all kinds of persecution you could just imagine. And, uh, you know, people, I layered those conflicts because, you know, my own life has been layered with that conflict, you know, these identities, because my father I I'd also was who served part for, for the Parchami, like communist wing. So I was branded as a communist too. And I had even living in the diaspora where like Afghan young people might, they were my friends, but then their parents told them like, oh, you can't be Nimat's friend anymore because his father was a communist. So like, I was like, how does that work? Cause I felt like, I felt like I was marginalized in the United States you know, just because of my father's political belief. And mind you, we, like my father wasn't even living with us at the time. And so these are the kind of things that are actually real. So we were going back about life writing. I think that the dramatic conflict, uh, you know, these identities and how they play out really uh, affected me. And I decided, you know, I wanted to, but, but I felt like telling my own story at the time, I felt like I didn't want to go there. I wanted to, I felt that the imaginary world would be much more interesting and I really wanted to capture that paradise lost and show what these identities meant before the civil war, which was the turning point for Afghanistan. And what happened when Afghanistan became like the epicenter of globalization, where all these identities came and were being fought and these ideologies were being fought by Cold War powers and regional powers, like trying to sway this country in their own direction, um, you know, trying to influence the theology and the political framework and these types of things and the people. So I think that, you know, like I said earlier, this care carpet weaver is the own voices, but it, I, you know, I suspended people in this belief so much that so many people, including many agents who, you know, who rejected it said, you know, why don't you just cast this as a memoir? Well, it's not a memoir. <laughs> you know, This is fiction. It's kind of insulting actually. But uh, now this is my second novel, Keeping Up with the Hepburns, is the identity is very similar to my own identities, but I also bringing, a, you know, the main character is gay, Afghan, American, but he's also a vegan. And so it's so real that like, like most of it is real, of only very little of it is fictionalized or maybe, you know, just embellished here and there. But I'm afraid that if I actually put this out there, and people are not going to believe, like the carpet weaver, everyone believes it's my own story. But because some of this stuff is so outrageous and so outlandish, even for me, and I'm like, I can't believe I did these things, you know? Um, and so people are not going to believe it, but it, it's going to be interesting uh, if, 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 if I tell people, yeah, it's an autobiographical novel or it's a fictional memoir, or like, I don't even know how I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to say, look, it's fiction. And then we'll have a, let the, let the readers decide what these mean, because even like, for example, like my character, Maihan, I had conceived him as a closeted homosexual who was just in denial about his sexuality until he explores it with, with Kanishka, right? But then like in the reviews, you know, in Tabish Khar, who did the first review in the Hindu, he presented Maihan as a bisexual. And then many readers in India, you know, they were reviewing my book and they were like, my hands are bisexual. And I was looking at it and then I reread my book and I'm like, you know what? They're right. My hand is a bisexual. <laughs> but to me, it doesn't take away from that experience that that reader had. And that, so the re reader created a reality which wasn't even my intention in the first place. 
So now I'm actually, I'm fine with, actually makes more sense with, bi, with my hand being a bisexual. <laughs> but for me at the time, I had always made it like he's just one of those typical gay men who will like, will take this, will never, admit, it'll just, even if they live a gay life, they'll have sexual experiences, they'll even have a boyfriend, but they'll keep denying it. They'll say that they're just, you know, kind of just experimenting or whatever. So I, I thought that was very interesting. Um, so yeah, I would say that my activism fueled my art and my art fueled my activism in writing The Carpet Weaver. Uh, because at the time, I know that in the very first drafts that, um, that uh, creative writing workshops, people were telling me, look, Nima, don't hammer us with the homosexuality and like how terrible it is, this woe is me narrative. You're just stumbling there. Tell us the story, you know? And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, that's right. Like I, I had to stop the activism and even, you know, one of um, the editor who picked who basically, um, my editor at Penguin Random House India, Amber Sal Chatterjee, he was waiting for LGBT manuscript. And he said all the manuscripts that he was rejecting were heavy on the activism little by way of art. So luckily, you know, once my story, like my, my voice, once I found the voice for Kanishka, you know, going to Afghanistan, and then coming out and re receiving the persecution and coloring in the draft, seeing what the old uh, old world Afghanistan looked like just from the remnants, you know, these shells of these buildings and just feeling what it would be like, these stories that my family and others have told me. So I think that that really helped crystallize my voice and get it and make it evolve and make me find out where that is. So what's interesting, what took, for example, like over a decade with the Carpet Weaver for me to write, right? Um, and bringing everything together, not only these identities and the character and the story and all these things. You know, I literally finished, I started uh, writing my second novel, you know, when the pandemic started and I'm done with the first draft in just a couple of months. And all this chaos where we have civil unrest and, you know, all the madness that's been happening here in the United States with the, with the being the epicenter. But I think that's happened because now it's like, I'm not looking at it, whereas like, trying to push an agenda. It's like, you know what, if you write good works of literature and if you stay true to your art as a real artist, not just keeping the status quo, but being a transformational artist, readers will get it. Readers will get it and it will create the change in the world that you want to see. So, but at the, at the end of the day, people have to come into the story because they like the story. So I think that that's, uh, that's something that I've learned in writing the second, my second novel, um, you know, and we'll see what happens from here on out. So I'm very, I'm very satisfied with the, uh, I think what Shaka was saying earlier that, you know, I think this is the point I was trying to make, like, if you don't have a lot of real life experience, then you go to the tap into the imagination. For me, yes, I will also say just like Sharif, I also had, the experience of working in a newsroom and seeing, I know a lot of people say like what works, a lot of these newsrooms are like, you know, when I worked at ABC News, it's like Disney Corporation was a parent company and CNN was, you know, uh, Turner. They have their own agendas of what, which, what makes the news, you know? But, I, but still, this, in terms of structuring the news of what is gonna be the most interesting and capturing the reader's attention, and there's a certain pacing and a certain type of a format and a certain type of delivery that you execute when you're telling a story that really needs to like touch a chord, whether it's you know fiction or nonfiction, whether you know um, whether it's our own stories or someone else's stories that we're trying to communicate. And I think that really helped me a lot. And I was like, you know, getting to the point where I was saying earlier about my creative writing court classmates who had read all this literature, but in terms of dramatic conflict, because they've lived a more privileged life, they never had the kind of struggles that I've had. So for them, they have to do like the Stephen King approach. Stephen King, I think, you know, even though I've read his memoir, he's had some difficulties, but he's still a white heterosexual male, lived the middle class existence, but he's a brilliant mind. He's a genius because he taps into his creativity in your imagination. And I think that this is like where we kind of negotiate. Okay, well, you know, here's, we want to create a character. They're going to have these identities. Um, and how are these identities going to create tension, going to create conflict, going to set the stage for drama that's going to propel to 300, 400 pages and keep the writer engaged? I think that, you know, I'm at a point now, thankfully, that I don't have to just write for my own, 
let's say, experience. Like my, my third novel, my fourth novel, has not, it's, all of my books are going to have LGBTQIA characters, identities, and themes. I have to honor that. And I'm not just writing about the gay, cisgender, gay perspective. I'm going to use other, uh, the other letters in our uh, lovely alphabet soup that we have. But I think that what I'm going to do is that um, I don't have to write from the Afghanistan perspective or, you know, like, it doesn't have to be the, the identities that I have. So like my, my, my characters can be a different ethnicity, different culture. And I'm very confident now because I've gone through this experience, this exercise that I've reached this point. And so this is for anybody who's out there who's listening. I think that the biggest struggle is the first, the first book, especially with fiction. Once you get that out, there's a, I know even Shaika now that's his third, he can probably relate to this. Like once you get, it's like a sense of accomplishment that you finish your first book. And then like by the second and third, you kind of, you're kind of, you know what, I think I can, I can even get this. But I think it's very important to reach a stage of not just basically um, sticking to our own identities. I think it's, it seems very good. And we can talk about this later on when we, you know, let's see what the question is like, but what, what, what if kind of complications happen when you are writing from an identity that maybe is a marginalized, persecuted person, it's maybe not, you know, but what if that, you know, depicting them and properly depicting them? I think that's also a huge, I know recently with American Dirt has been very problematic where you had a white woman got a seven figure book deal and a movie deal and she wrote about uh, the Mexican American experience and a lot of Mexican Latinx people were critical about that. And so I think that um, these are things that we have to think about, you know, does an Indian person, I've had many Indians who've been coming to me and asking and telling me, look, I have the story. I taught this course called Unpadownable, how to write a commercially viable novel at the Tata Lit Fest in Mumbai. And, uh, and, and, and ever since then, you know, people found out that, you know, that they're just like, hey, can I pitch this to you? Or they meet me. I have a little synopsis. I have this story. What do you think? I'm really surprised by the number of Indians who are writing non-Indian characters. And it's fair game. Anyone can write any, anybody, right? So, but I, I found that very fascinating to me, uh, you know, these types of questions, like who gets to write whose stories, these identities? Like, do we, do we get to write our own stories only or do, can we fight other, write other people's. And maybe this will segue into your next question. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, Shoikat, would you like to go next? And I think what I'm going to do is, I know we had another question uh, from me that I had lined up, but I think we might have to skip that or find a way to integrate that into the audience questions, because I see we have a couple uh, that we can take and I'll direct those directly to those of you that they uh, might concern. But sure. for now, just the intersection uh, in, of identities that you see in your work. Sure, sure. I'll try, I'll try to be brief. Um, yeah, I think the big intersection in my novel is between religion and sexuality. Um, obviously, that's the kind of thing which inevitably gets politicized. And, um, you know, I think uh, continuing the conversation with Nimant about what how religions are. And I think I should I like to say that just the way Islam has a um, sort of sensory aspect, of course, Islamic art is a great example. Hinduism also has a very abstract aspect as a monotheistic core. Uh, but in this particular instance, as I was saying, I was very drawn to the sensory aspect of religion, especially again, while, while a growing boy experiences it. I mean, the kind of songs, the hymns, you know, the smell of incense, flowers. And I was, you know, again, all of this, as, as I said, I'm very powered by atmosphere. This boy is sitting um, in a prayer hall uh, and they're singing and they're, and th this boy, my protagonist, Anirvan, who's called Yogi because he's wants to be a monk. And that's part of his building at the moment. He's spiritually lifted. He admires the saffron figures, the saffron monks. And he also has a bit of a crush on them like any, any teacher. Um, but he's at the same time, your knees are touching another boy. Your hand is touching another boy. So this incredible moment when your mind can be in a kind of spiritually attractive space, but your body is speaking another language. So this intersection of the spiritual and, and desire was what really was very important to me that, you know, it, it, it has to come. Um, and obviously, uh, the thing is that the, the novel is set in the late 80s and early 90s. And this was not a time when um, saffron was a political force in Bengal. It obviously 
had become a political force in India. Um, but even though there's always this knowledge, especially people who grew up in Bengal, that the logical opposite of saffron is red. That is the opposite of the Hinduism is communism. And again, this is exactly where I think Nimit's work and our my work is interesting resonance. That um, in, in what what happens in this in this novel is that this boy is very uh, there are two charismatic figures who sort of mentor him. One is uh, a monk who's sort of I guess sort of ominously called Kamal Swami Lotus. You know, again, people have pointed out the resonance of that in today. Um, but the other person is a teacher with leftist leanings who is who obviously believes that this all religion stuff is bullshit. He doesn't have any sympathy. He's very he's very secular. And then again, you know, I show this person to have certain connections with the Communist Party. Um, and um, and I think in many ways, I mean, I think novels um, come from very wild places. We can't we don't really think of. Um, sort of the topical, but at the same time, we live in in a certain age, and the spirit of the time always touches us. And um, what I realize is, I ended up uh, showing, uh, like, especially certain parts of India, Bengal being one of them. We have this notion that we are very liberal, we are left leaning, we are not communal. We Muslims have always sort of thrived in Bengal, but at the same time, there's this incipient Islamophobia among the Bengali middle class, Hindu middle class, which often comes out through a narrative of class. So the sort of comments like, oh, there's a village, Muslim village next to you. Oh, they're not going to talk about their being Muslim, but oh, they're, they're dirty. You know, this is something you hear a lot about. You hear a lot about, even today, I, I'm shocked when I go to these parties, you know, fairly um, privileged people, um, middle and upper middle class, they will talk about Muslim neighborhoods using a certain kind of language, you know, a certain kind of um, a certain kind of uh, class language. And I guess what I showed in the opening chapter of my novel, these boys are sitting and watching an India-Pakistan cricket match. And India-Pakistan cricket match is always a time when this kind of nationalism comes into play. And, um, and there's a Muslim village right outside the hostel. And the idea is that, oh, they're cheering whenever Pakistani bowlers get a, get a wicket. And, and this, this, this sort of narrative is so much a part of India and um, and I guess um, what I what I wanted to show was that um, you know th this is an atmosphere where you know they're praying and this, and in the middle of this very Hindu highly Sanskritic prayer you hear the sound of Azan you know sound of the, the, the Azan kind of coming out five times a day how do you deal with that and I realized that this um, in a way I unconsciously was puncturing the myth of a liberal middle-class India, which would like to see itself as uh, tolerant, but there were these gaps of Islamophobia, there are these narratives and how even young boys are socialized into this language to talk about Muslims in a certain way. And, uh, and of course the fact was I was writing this novel, I started writing it in 2017. So in a way the point in which I was sitting and writing it had to influence even though I was evoking an earlier time. And the fact that when you write like this, you realize things exist in a continuum. Obviously, Babri Masjid had happened at the time. So in a way, you know, these narratives were already on. But what, what I think I feel most satisfied about, and it was a completely accidental achievement, I'd say that in a way, I ended up portraying the society India was in the process of becoming, hadn't become. It, it didn't know that it was going to become that. There's this sentence right at the end of the novel where Kamal Swami says um, that one day all will turn to renounce, one day all will turn saffron. And obviously he means it as, you know, saffron as the color of renunciation. And I won't give away the ending for those who, who haven't read it because you know, donning of saffron is a big part of this novel, but of course the line, one day all will turn saffron. I mean, obviously I was thinking of Ranjit Singh's so, sub lal ho jayega, one day all will turn red. He was talking of British India and that is impossible not to remember. So it, it was kind of a retrospective picture of what religious identity would become. And of course the kind of, place of sexuality there. What does sexuality belong? I mean, I was talking to another um, writer, a friend of mine, Shondi Roy, and he points out that there are, it's very interesting how certain RSS leaders have come out 
in support of homosexuality they have actually acknowledged that it's not like we assume that a right wing in those obviously goes against it but it's obviously much more complicated and as many people have sort of shown it you know um so all these intersections i think come you know in many ways but they obviously come a, in a novelistic way which is why they're kind of half as that and secondly because i write through the mind of a very young protagonist they're not theorized they're not really understood but they're all there yeah shari Yeah, so just want to clarify. I think because most of the conversations are around fiction so far, and so it's very difficult for me to because my books are not biography, and as I said, I've written, so I don't really talk about. I don't like to talk about myself, and you know, in that sense. But even coming to your question on uh, on intersectionality and and that space, because that's a very open thing. It's a very subjective thing as to what you see as an intersection. and it's also quite limiting to say that it has to do with workplace in my case because uh, it's it's a long journey which uh, and different career lines so uh, and if you come towards the end of my book i'm talking about the heteronormative and uh, i'm talking about the fact that we are still living with a press i i question the press a lot i also question the privilege lot it includes me as well but i i question their thinking about life because uh, we're living in a country where people are still talking about same sex marriage because it's the typical heteronormative thing of you becoming part of their life and their structure you know and they don't want to see the intersections of the existence of humanity by and large and uh, they 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 want to see the same privileged systems they want to see relationships with just two people and leaving it to two right they don't want to see personal dignity without marriage and so i talk about all of that because if you go back to even september 6 because my book is continues to last to september 6 2018 uh the monks the leading headlines in the newspapers at that time was love at first sight now anyone with a uh, iota Uh, of any intelligence would know that what did the Supreme Court give us in our lives? What did they give us? Did they give us love, the right to love? No, they didn't. All that they gave us was the right to have sex, and that was men having sex with men. So I have talked about various things that challenge the power structures, and I sit in those intersections of various positions that I would have held. in my life as a child or as a son as a brother as a, a school boy to a, someone going to college or then exploring a career and different careers at different stages and uh, and 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 so the whole book covers history actually in many ways of what was happening particularly in the period in delhi because that's where I lived the longest i talk about the hypocrisy in society I talk about the questions that many of us have, and that's the response I've generally got from a lot of people who already have a partner. Actually, from the younger lots, the younger lots have had a much easier, a far easier life uh, in, in in a certain way in terms of at least us being able to discuss sexuality and sex. And I come from the time where well, none of this was, uh, you know, discussed. And there are still people who are going through journeys which are similar. Uh, to to mine, so I I question the class system in the book. Okay, I question the adoption of the class system and of narratives of hate that are dominant in the kind of politics we have. So uh, I I also question the hierarchy in a workplace, where I inverted the increment systems. which must have been my own politics to 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 question power and the uh, and to reduce wealth gaps because of the capitalist systems that we currently have and we're seeing that even in today so there are many intersections in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, uh things but i have not fictionalized anything except to change certain names because either we couldn't get in touch with the person and so i'm not imagined anything uh, it's just for the taste Uh, as a story, and uh, 
it's for the people to read and find the intersections themselves i can't really talk about it because i've not created anything i've just shared a story so i've shared my life and uh, you know so it's it, it talks about my my uh my uh, attraction to someone on a charpai who was one of the dhobi's uh, relative i i talk about uh, different kinds of attractions with with uh, waif looking men and quarter uh, three laborers um it could be even equations of power as well uh and uh, I've, I've obviously i will continue to question the press i'm i commentate also you know, as a as a as a journalist uh, with a journalist background uh, i think i continue to commentate on what is happening in it so the book goes across all of these periods times and history so unfortunately it's not fiction you know which all of them unfortunate about that <laughs> yeah no because just the question is on those lines mostly so um so i see that with your answers actually all of you have answered a variety of the questions that we received which is great news because we were sort of uh lagging behind the one sort of recurring question that's coming up and i can see a link with something that i had in mind as well is that you know why after you know there being all of this awareness presumed awareness right why after we've seen significantly more representation over the last two decades than before um does the lgbtq community still face so much discrimination and this has been asked in a number of different ways it's been asked with in relation to the media it's been asked in relation to pop culture it's been asked in relation to books so my question is essentially about representation right and and then what is sort of the power of representation but equally what are some of then the limitations of representation because if the assumption is that we have indeed achieved that representation to some extent um then why is it perhaps not translating into um less discrimination or is there something wrong with the form that that representation is taking so uh can i have shoika take that first obviously it- very complicated question and i i do believe that um, you know the question you also had for us that representation is is always a good thing more and more representation and it's a trial and error method we'll get things wrong um and i do believe that um you know i mean i mean having written um a romance story i mean i always it always thrills me more to see that oh uh, it's a love story as opposed to be a queer story and the, one waits for the day when a queer story will queer love story will be read in just as a kind of a love story and um and i think um you know i think in many ways uh, sharif touched on this that the biases are uh, in we all know that that the heteronormativity is is, is works in conjunction with capitalist society because it has a certain productive unit unit the heteronormity family is a certain productive unit which keeps labor alive which keeps you know those of us who read our marx and all those or we know that you know reproduction is obviously reproduction of labor force is what keeps capitalism alive and uh, these are very entrenched biases what is more fascinating is that these biases have a root in modernity the whole notion that to be traditional is to be reactionary and to be modern is to be liberal is is reversed here we all know those people who sort of written about um sexuality and laws in india a lot of a lot of them have commented that it's the victorian um mentality which is really sort of imposed events a law like 3 article 377 is clearly the work of colonial section. um section sorry section um 377 uh, is is clearly a case of um sort of the british colonial rules and uh, a certain kind of protestant um, mindset a certain kind of protestant prudery uh, obviously you know a lot of work has revealed that india in the past had a lot lot more fluidity so i think um a representation has to go on and again you know there will be mistakes there will be books will be especially the people like us who work at the intersection of art and identity because you know the demands and nimath has already addressed that the demands of art sometimes even runs counter to the needs of activism when you write a novel about queer identity that sits 
in the, in a coming of age there's a certain uncertainty a certain hiddenness and one of the reviews that was critical of my novel was that oh why is queer love not celebrated loudly and you know for me it was like oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an extremely vigilant atmosphere it's an atmosphere where people are trying to hush hush people are trying to discover it's not an atmosphere where one can so i think this this kind of conflicting demands between art and activism will going on and there'll be another sphere of course legal activism pedagogic activism you know political activism and uh, it it goes on but i think sometimes the biases are too deep but i think you know and animat can address that but in many ways i think the biases against homosexuality is even deeper in a protestant society like america and you know, if you look at the republican government and the biases of people like donald trump and mike pence and the kind of things they've said ag against homosexual cultures is in many ways a protestant capitalist culture i think can be even more ruthless against homosexuality because it is not easy to harness it into this capitalist mindset of reproduction production and reproduction but i'm sure you know um sharif and nimat can say more about it because they're directly involved in the in activism process uh sharif would you like to go next i know you said a little bit about media representation earlier but if you want to elaborate no, i would i would say i would say that firstly we need to break a lot of notions and barriers to start with even the idea of literature and storytelling needs to change and i think in your earlier panel urvashi pointed out as to who are the voices if we're going to have english speaking voices determining rights change perception and then you're putting it into a class or again putting it into a box and it's not going to spread and it's not going to work across the nation that's for that clear uh the like because she i think said the first wish on dalits should be dalits she said it in her earlier plan and uh, and it's it's uh, because otherwise it's going to get into the space of a population and uh, which is why actually i flipped the idea of diversity and inclusion and said queer and inclusive to the rainbow movement cuz it done it was diversity and inclusion from a heterosexual world which actually doesn't understand exclusion to start with which doesn't understand inclusion therefore you know very few can be truly empathetic in that field so and then when you go to the old idea of representation i think uh and uh, the question that is being asked uh, about we need more representation but it's across different themes the society doesn't exist in a book nor does it exist alone in a film so we need those so which is why a duty chan matters a lot just her coming out one is a background and the other is she's a sports woman you know me coming out doesn't matter that much or nema coming out doesn't matter that much in a society like ours because we need representation which is diverse also and we will lose the plot as a nation and as a movement if we don't have those voices if we don't have the voices of a trans woman or a trans man and a trans dalit or a dalit queer activist or if we don't have and adivasi if we don't have other tribal representations etc because the problem actually lies is the discussion and debates are taking place in very exclusive environments and they are not very inclusive environments and uh, they also are dominated by one kind of language and one kind of upbringing and you know it doesn't have that representation and that's with the press as well as i said if for a long time for over a year for over a year there were people parents who thought we were free and because they read the press because they watch movies which don't tell you what actually happens like the shubhmanga what the or be sabhan or whatever it is it doesn't tell you about the conflicts it doesn't tell you about anything as such you know it's it's far from even scratching the surface so you know unless the pop culture cannot be challenged unless the press doesn't wake up to the truth you know 
we will have to fight these battles in our own limited spaces that's why i mean that's why you have like a queer lit in chennai you have a marathi uh, poetry and literature being invoked uh, by bindu and pune and bringing it out etc because it has to resonate with the diversity within the community as well and not the diversity that they have to sexual issue to see you know so i think we 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 we've got a hell of a lot to do and, and a long way to to go and and even when i came up with my book i didn't realize the importance of that book until people started telling me that it resonates with their life or oh god they wanted it and for me it was just my story that was it i done it in 27 28 days and i i didn't even really uh, want to go back to it or think about it because i had to move on i'm also doing a lot of advocacy in this space so so again i i think uh we have got a long really really a long way to go in understanding diversity to start with you know in, in and and if we if we can't do that we would be doing almost nothing because we're still living in this world of delhi and mumbai you know dominating narratives and dominating stories dominating ideas etc we are not listening to what's happening in kolkata chennai indore god knows where or there's just so many places moirang in far you know of of what is happening in those lives and the chimes out there there are some amazing stories there from those regions and i know uh, uh, nemat was saying that it's easy to get published etc no no it isn't it isn't he's very fortunate to be published i'm very fortunate to be published the mainstream publishers don't touch there are top uh uh literary agents who will not touch poetry who will not touch an unknown reasonably unknown person so there is a lot of discrimination within the publishing world itself for what it publishes and what it doesn't you know and uh, so i think if the publishing world has to be honest to diversity and representation and not run around a capitalist approach altogether and they have to obviously rethink their business models one and not saying don't do that but there has to be greater representation of publishing as well at all kinds of forums right to to really include yeah. uh nimat maybe we can conclude with you yes absolutely yeah i'd like to um respond to Sh- shari's point about um basically how it is easy to get published of course i think one of the biggest hurdles uh from my experience traveling through india meeting a lot of aspiring authors from everywhere all parts of the country and the messages that i receive and engaging with them is not so much i don't believe at least with my agent i don't think he discriminates against people i don't think kanishka gupta who is my agent would discriminate against somebody because of my caste or class i'm sorry what is your too. Mine too. exactly no. i think yeah. the, the biggest thing that in my conversations with him and my conversations with anuj bahari and many other people within the literary world and the publishing world is just that um and also like i think ashoka university where saika saika majumdar teaches is one of the few creative writing programs the lack the lack of creative writing courses fiction you have to learn the techniques of fiction one of the reasons why it took me so long to write this novel is because i had to acquire all these tools and i'm still acquiring tools i'm still this summer taking two courses in creative writing at johns hopkins university you know what i mean so i think that um i to be honest and from my opinion from an outside perspective i think that this is a big problem in india it, it is the access to creative writing courses taught by professionals who can help uh nurture guide an author to become a commercially viable author because it doesn't take you can't do this on your own i really respect shara for writing his memoir in in 28 days and i've i've read his book it's phenomenal but not everyone has this gift that you have okay especially with the fiction as a different beast So you know, but I can't write it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we have to understand that um hey so that's the one thing I want to say and then I definitely agree that representation is a problem. I mean look at us the three of us here uh, and the books the protagonists that we're describing are cisgender males. 
So we don't have, where's the transgender person? Where is the intersexual person? Where is the asexual person? Where, like the other LGBTQIA people, they're not part of this conversation. Uh, you know, so definitely is a huge problem. And um, so we need more, because if we don't control our narratives, then other people will. Um, and I think that's very crucial to have that representation. Or what they'll do is you'll have a member, I, I'm not so much concerned about an LGBTQIA person stereotyping and uh, like poking fun. I think that we generally have empathy, although I wish there is a, like an, un, an unknown a, a person in, in Bollywood who made a movie that makes fun of gay people, but we all know who that is. But generally speaking, when it comes to literature, we're more sensitive and we're more mindful about not making fun of members within our own community. If there's, so like, we don't want non LGBTQIA people to write LGBTQIA characters and get it all wrong to just focus on the cliches and the tropes and the stereotypes. And yeah, we, had it, a uh, yeah, we don't want to make fun of like our gender identity or sexual orientation. Of course you can have characters like my second novel. I'm making fun of the protagonist because of this, but it's not because of a sexuality, it's because of all the other peculiarities that just makes this person a, just like an objectionable, reprehensible person <laughs> to, to like the mainstream, you know? But in actuality, he's just exercising his own existence. He's exercising his own freedom to, to honor the tiniest minority on the planet, which is the individual, right? And, uh, and so having a freedom of conscience to say, look, this is, expressing yourself as an artist, as a human being. So I think it's very important that we do have more, of course, like we do have more representation, but it also, and, and the thing is that once, you know, our writings here become more mainstream, become more widely read, there is, we can become victims of our own success within the LGBTQIA community which means that other heterosexual people will be like, oh, we can monetize this. We can write about LGBTQIA characters, not because they want to honor us in their art, but because that they realize they can make money out of this or that they could check off the diversity box. Because like in the United States, for example, uh, what's happening now in the publishing world, a lot of white heterosexual native people are writing the stories of Black people or African Americans and Latinx people and Muslim people. And it's becoming a problem because it's like those people, those voices, we have, we have fiction and nonfiction authors from members of those communities that they're not lifting those up, up those writers with six, seven figure book deals and Hollywood movie deals, but they're lifting up white writers and the books and they're parroting that dominant narrative. Like in my book, like in my, in Afghanistan, for example, every single book about Afghanistan since September 11th terrorist attacks has gone down this trope that, you know, it's a, everything barbarism, burqas, bomb blasts, bacha bazi, all of these different things, anything villainous, great. It's a good sell. It justifies U.S. militarism, occupation, these types of things. Anything about India, like India is the land of two things, income inequality and poverty and spiritual rejuvenation. So you could write, eat, pray, love, and be like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm like, I've lived a hard life working in this rat cage, but I'm gonna go to India now and get my spiritual rejuvenation. But you know, India is a lot more complicated. So like in my second novel, in, when this character comes to India, he's not coming there for spiritual rejuvenation. He's coming to India for spiritual warfare. <laughs> you know? He's not coming to India to basically to talk about the income inequality. I mean, we have enough, my favorite book that inspired me to become a writer, which is The White Tiger by Aravan Adiga, from Arun Tati Roy to Amata Bush. Like every single Indian and non-Indian writer in the diaspora in India has written about the income inequality. Income inequality is a huge problem in India. I'm not trying to estimate that, right? But so does the United States. We're all in the middle of this pandemic, but the United States is the only country that has all this looting and rioting and civil unrest. You know what I mean? It's like, so does South Africa, so does Brazil, so does China. But no, only India has to be the slumdog millionaire, like let's give it nine Academy Awards. And you know, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of it because if you have an impoverished mind, you're always gonna have an impoverished mind. I'm gonna rebrand India to make it a rich, fabulous India. And every Indian will be acting and thinking like a rich Indian. Now that doesn't mean go chase the American dream. 
It means stop being a Mother Teresa and giving handouts and do something about it. There's a word for it, Neemat, called poverty porn. I'm sure you're... I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. You know, these are these are pornographic urges, actually. But yeah. and, and listen, I love Arun Tati Roy. I love all these writers, but enough is enough. Enough is enough. So anyway, so that, that, is it what that does, that circular narrative, it, you get pigeonholed into that narrative and you can never think outside of the box. I don't even want to be put in the box to think outside of the box. Let's just all just be free. So that's can I, just what I... I'm sorry. I wanted to pick up on, I wanted to pick up on this point about uh, that you were mentioning about these various writers writing about South Africa, writing about Latin American countries, uh, about different stories without without really representing them, you know, the whole thing about representation and appropriation, right? So we've had this problem and the, the community was up in arms against, uh, and we don't, there's no harm mentioning the name of the soul over the press, Nandini Krishnan, when she yes. did the book, right? And, and it created a huge problem and uh, within the community. And now it's, uh, you know, it, 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 and I think Shaikat's faced this question as well. And, and I'm not defending Shaikat here, but the fact is, uh, his is a lived experience to the extent that he was in a hospital, he's seen certain things. So certain stories can be told and should be told from a certain lens. That's, that's perfectly fine. But when they couldn't try and usurp our space and start telling our stories with their lens, this is like, you know, same-sex marriage yeah. is the end all for us. So while you're a school kid, while you're in at home, any discrimination you face doesn't really matter as long as you get married. And uh, that the kind of hetero uh, thing gaze becomes very very problematic uh, out there, and and we've had we've had sections of the press, and I bring the press back in, who only wants to see uh, drag artists as a representation of the community, who want to see flamboyant, colorful outfits as representation of playing out, uh, you know, of the community, and rep again, it's just gender men uh, from the community. Uh, Trans representation is, is so limited, you know. Uh, uh, the lesbian, I mean, it's, it's strange, and I, I'm just going back to some of the comments, which are also there are questions uh, and points you raise, is that when Delhi had its first pride, 2008, okay, it was timed with the Stonewall riots. It was run by women. The majority were women, women groups, as well as lesbian representation, and maybe gender fluid, but they didn't use the term gender fluid at that time. And what has happened is exactly the heterosexual kind of structure is men have taken over that in 2018, 19, 20, we're talking about invisibilization of the lesbian. So again, it goes back to representation and who tells these stories and who's sharing these stories and who's, who's making it available, who's facilitating these stories to reach larger audiences you know so, so i've gone from one point to another but it's really yeah, picking up on can something. i add just one thing about yeah well, but one can i add one more thing really quickly very, very Between quick. men. yeah yeah the, the, i'm glad you brought up that book with the trans masculine uh, perspective that was written the good news is the indian uh, that that book got very terrible reviews and it's tanked in the marketplace and there was protests against it so it's, it's not like the indians are just passively allowing this to happen you know what I mean? People yeah. are standing up to the J.K. Rowling's, whether in their literature or in their public, uh, you know, uh, communication, if they're speaking against anti-gay, anti-trans, anti-anything, uh, you know, the people will speak up. And so that's what I'm really thankful for in the space that we're in. And just to add that, I think this actually really reflects the patterns of the publishing and the culture industry, because, you know, um, as it happened when um, I had an event in Chennai, um, but my book, the, the author of this particular book we are talking about, Trans Men, was on the panel, and I wasn't aware of this, but there was a lot of protest from the queer and trans community um, that why to be appear on the platform as, um, as basically Nandini. And um, what I saw there, and I mean, I, I read the book then, but what I saw there was there was indeed, you know, whether the book obviously has problems, but what, I, what was more disconcerting was there was a pattern in which uh, the people who were protesting were consistently excluded out of certain platforms. And who gets a platform, again, goes back to your caste, your education, your 
you know your relationship with the publishing industry which obviously in turn reflects a certain capitalist marketplace and in the end you know we and my publishers we decided to cancel the event um out of solidarity solidarity with the queer and trans community because it's not like you can sort of change the platform system but at least you can sort of break a pattern and i was struck by the voices that came up when that event was scheduled and you know one now we all know why so yeah okay great this has been an incredibly thought provoking conversation thank you to all three of you for joining us from uh different time zones nimat i know it's late your time now but uh thank you both as well sharif and shoikat and uh i'm just going to thank our audiences as well and hand it over thank to sulghi my colleague um thank you so much thank, thank you. you it's been a pleasure thank you panel thank you manjri yeah thank uh, you so